name is Okwi Simon Peter. Yes, and uh, I'm a lawyer by profession, but I'm also a student doing my master's in law. I am I work for Down Syndrome International. I am a, and I am a board member for Albinism Umbrella. Okay, the family where I come from, we are two siblings. I am the younger brother and, and I have a, an elder brother who is an, a water engineer with National Water and Sewerage Corporation. And we, we are privileged to only have our mother as a single mom. No, he's not a person with albinism. Yes, uh, it was uh, being a child, I was a little bit curious being ha having a brother without albinism and uh, I, I have an albin uh, a disability with albinism and excel so most times I would see he's different from me I'm different from him so it would it would bring a lot of questions in my mind that being a young child and etc you wouldn't be able to express and even ask anyone about it so it, I used to have it in me alone yes but uh, it was lovely and he helped me grow while I was young he was always supportive With my parents, not really. Uh, okay, with my mother, because uh, yes, with my dad, I had challenges because then I was the cause of separation between my mom and my dad. He never believed his clan or him can father a child like me with my disability. So I did have, so I lived without a father figure in my life. I only stayed with my mom. Yeah, up to now I'm still bitter in my mind because then growing up every child with or without a disability would love to have a father figure in their life mentoring and guiding them but I didn't have that opportunity and when I heard about what he did and what he said about me it really made me so bitter. When I started school absolutely challenging because then in my village I was the only child with albinism and it was the first case in my village. I, I started three years. I struggled just with the primary one and I gave up with school because there was a lot of like discrimination. Your age names and etc. When you reach school compound, they begin laughing, they'll begin clapping hands, see and etc. so I'd say, is there anything wrong with me and etc. So I would always look at myself as something that is bad and etc. Because then when I arrive at school, everyone is laughing, is finger pointing at you and etc and then even the teachers were not supportive and etc with albinism it comes with visual challenges too and so whenever i try to sit in front they would always chase me behind and etc so it reached a time when i and my mom gave, gave up with education and etc so it took uh, a head teacher who was transferred to my school where i was because he came from a station needs school uh, it took him coming to talk to my mother to convince them to take me to a special needs school where I started picking up very well for primary and even part of my O-level education. And then in secondary uh, A-level, I went to an annex and, and, and a school in Iganga, Iganga Secondary School where I started now with other normal bodied people. Yes, it did because right from childhood I thought maybe I would be someone who would be useful uh, in the community. When I, look at, when I looked at, at that time, people were educated and were making some contributions in the community. I felt like in the future I would want to be one of them. But then, basically failing to go back to school three years at the time when I was ready to go to school, it really hindered and I thought there would be nothing that would come out of myself. Uh, yes, I, I would say it was a mixture. Uh, one, many people, I think the majority looked at me like a person who is like special in a negative way. Like yes, they wouldn't, most of them wouldn't want to associate with a person like me because they thought maybe I'm a result of a curse. Maybe God was punishing my family and clan for having done something that was so grave at that time. That's why I was produced with that condition and etc. And then some were sympathetic. There was really none who was positive because even the theme was not that positive. So there was nothing really positive that I had to struggle growing through in such a community. Honestly, it has been a challenge and etc. 
because many females, especially potential suitors, would think uh, how would they are more afraid of what the people, the perception thought will have about them being with me with, and with my disability than what they feel and uh, with what they have about me because they would be having a genuine feel and desire to be with me as their spouse but they are more scared of people's attitude and what they will say about them being with me. So it has been a challenge and etc. with relating with them. There are really a lot. Um, there are really a lot of like I would say starting from the grassroots, it's really absolutely child because we have a right to education. I would begin with we have a right to to belong to a family and etc. And the law says we have a right to know who your parents are, both father and mother. But then we don't benefit uh, from that right of knowing who your family is and etc. And even having a right, the UNCRPD says you have a right even to belong, to choose where to, to stay, and also who you can call your father and mother. I personally didn't have that opportunity because I, my father neglected me and etc. And it's what many people with albinism go through and etc. Mainly they rely on now the mercy and love of their mothers and etc. So right to belong to a family is always violated for people with albinism. But also the right of association, free association and movement in the community is hard because then the society is very hostile and etc. When they see you come and etc. People begin like, it's not laughing at, but it's more of ridiculing and mocking you and etc. So at times you fear to move out. I can give an example of during this pandemic and etc. I tried to move out in the village and etc. But then they, they mistook my disability to, to be from China and so they thought I was carrying COVID-19 and etc. So everyone where you would go, they say, ah, no, COVID is coming. And so at times people will want even to stone you up and etc. So the right to move and have free association with others is absolutely hard and it has been violated and etc. And then I can give you an example of um, rape. Many women, especially women with albinism, have been victims of rape. I can give you an example of uh, in Mbale when we we're just starting Elgon Foundation for Persons with Albinism. There was a teenager of around 17 years. She was raped and etc. When we tried to go to the police with her and etc., the police who are supposed to be implement and protect the law of both property and even people said the, the, the perpetrator, the one who raped her, was just finding out how women with albinism taste and etc. So they have been victims of sexual harassment and etc. And then we have been victims also of, uh, we, would have, we would want to have health and good livelihood and etc. But then our rights basically to health is limited because then most health providers, including doctors, nurses, and generally health workers, who we think we would rely on to be knowing the biological genesis of our disability to help us, but most of them uh, don't have an idea. They, and so it becomes hard for us because we go through a lot of health conditions. It becomes absolutely hard to go for even health help from them. Yes, I think they need to, uh, I would feel like, an integration of policies that are pro-persons with uh, albinism. Uh, basically, the government of Uganda, even after ratifying the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, has done less for persons to protect, to develop those policies and laws that are pro-persons with albinism and etc. Very few communities, I can tell you, like for in Eastern Uganda, maybe in Bali and surrounding areas of Mbale, where mainly there is a high concentration of people with albinism, there has been something like bylaws and some policies in the districts that have been done that favor persons with albinism. But as a country, as a region in East Africa, but as Uganda in particular, less has been done in regard to policy and legislative formulation about persons with albinism. So it would be a plea and it would be our pleasure if the government and key stakeholders come and help us to try to develop policies and laws that are pro persons with albinism. It is, it's a little bit challenging, though personally I have not faced it much, 
but uh, the stories I hear from colleagues and what I see being a, a, a legal man and who tries to, a person who tries to advocate for employment advocacy for persons with uh, albinism and etc. It is a challenge because many employers are afraid to take on us, we people with albinism, because they fear like how will their customers and clients see you and etc. I've also faced a challenge uh, in trying to uh, get clients because I'm a, a lawyer, you would want to go and represent someone in court, a court of law, and ex which is part of employment, and etc. But then someone is scared and say, "Do you even know any law?" and etc. I'm uh, glad for my position being a board member of an organization that I belong to, and I feel home at the Albinism Umbrella. One of the things we can do basically to make our livelihood and stay in our communities better is trying to advocate for friendly policies and laws because I think it's the beginning point because if we have something we can refer to to demand for the promotion, respect uh, of our fundamental human rights, then that will be a basis for us to begin everything on. Right now as a country, I feel like we have generic laws which we can seek little redress to and accept that if we can, uh, we can as an albinism umbrella, try to advocate for, in the national level, uh, laws and policies that can positively impact on the lives of people with albinism, then that would be a good goal. And then also, presumably one is because we have the uh, skin challenge and etc. If the government and etc. if we can advocate for this kind of production of sunscreen, because then importing is extremely extensive and etc. But if we can begin local production of sunscreen, then that can help even people in the villages who cannot be able to afford the large sums of money to buy this and etc. And then even education, basically. Education is a key, like personally, I'm able to make a decent livelihood on my own because I've got the chance and the privilege to study. I'm just having a worry for young brothers and sisters with albinism in the village who are still going through a lot of this discrimination and are unable to access education and even the situation has been made worse with the COVID-19 and etc.